Hey everyone, I am coming to you live on Instagram. This is my first Instagram live for Pitch and Publish, but if you are hopping in, my name is Erica. I am a freelance writer and I am here today to talk to you a little bit about what I do and talk with my friend Clarissa Mole, who is, uh, has been a part of my courses in the past, who is a fabulous writer and we're going to talk a little bit about her writing journey. I see you, Clarissa, you have joined and I'm trying to figure out how to add you. There we go, view request. Are you there? Oh, there you are. <laughs> I was like, what did I do wrong? <laughs> Hey, how's it going, Clarissa? Good. Good to talk to you. Well, thank you so much for joining me for my inaugural Instagram Live. I'm so glad to be here. I haven't done these in so long. Oh, it's so great to be back on Instagram. Yes. Well, um, I brought you on today to talk to you a little bit about your writing journey. Um, I want you to be able to talk about your book a little bit. Um, and then also we're going to talk a little bit about um, my course, Bragworthy Bylines, that you took. You took the very first one of them, and you have been such an encouragement to me. Um, so tell us a little bit about yourself, Clarissa, and a little bit about your writing journey. Yeah, so I am a writer uh, north of Boston, and I am a published author. I love to pitch. I get really excited. <laughs> And I can pitch and publish. And uh, so I've written for a variety of outlets. And um, I also work in corporate communications. So work for an ad agency and do the marketing and communications work that is behind the scenes in a lot of writing. Uh, but it's a great life. It's uh, pieced together in a kind of a patchwork sort of way. But it offers me the opportunity to do a lot of different kinds of writing, which I think actually makes me a better writer in the end. Well, you know, and I focus on this account, I focus a lot on pitching because that is something that I love. It's something that you love. And so tell us a little bit about why you love pitching and what you've learned in the past several years as, you, as you've been able to really get your name out there. You publish in Christianity Today, the Gospel Coalition, Relevant. I know you've been in lots of other publications. So tell us about your pitching journey and what you love about it. Yeah, I feel like it's a sort of ancient caveman hunter-gatherer sort of thing. I just love the hunt. Uh, I'm excited to yeah, and try to flesh it out in maybe, you know, three main points and think through it just on the back of the napkin and, um, and then put some words to it and send it off to an editor and see if they'll take it. There's an excitement there that is just so much fun for me. And um, I, I could, if I had the time to pitch more, I would pitch all day long every day. I mean, it's just a lot of fun. Uh, I think, of course, everybody loves a byline. So that is exciting too. So the prospect of the byline on the horizon, that just keeps me going. But I think there's also a piece of um, writing as a way to process. And a lot of times I'll take an idea that just springs into my head and I think, I would like to understand this better. So what if I could figure out how to write a piece about it? And mm -hmm. I could do some other research. I could talk to some folks and I could use writing as a way for me to process this. Uh, so I do think, you know, selfishly speaking, writing is a great way to think about what you, what you want to understand about a particular topic and to think through that. And, um, so that makes pitching a lot of fun personally for me too. Yeah. It's a really powerful way to be able to get a message out there about something that you care about. I find, you know, it's like sometimes we feel almost, you know, inhibited to not be able to do much about the, the causes that we care about or the things that we feel need to get out there. Um, and as writers, whether or not you're publishing in a huge publication, like you have a platform to be able to get it out there. Um, so when you're thinking of a story, how do you know that you've got it to the point where you're like, okay, this is something that an editor is going to be interested in. Like, what do you have any sort of like checkoffs where you're like, I know that this is an idea that's really going to resonate with an editor. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think about the things that I used to teach my students when I was teaching uh, back about a decade ago, you know, is it timely? Is it timeless? What are the mm. of both? So it's got to be timely. What is the hook there that is going to draw them in? And not just the hook that you're seeing in the headlines right now. Like, what is your particular angle on this that um, where the writing that you do in your lane, you know, I write in bereavement support. So how can bereavement support speak to this particular thing that's going on in the news or this particular idea that is trending? So you're always thinking about how to make this timely and writing outside of your lane just because it's timely. I think it's kind of dangerous. You mm -hmm. may 
not having something intelligent to say, and an editor will notice that right away. So as much as you can write within your lane as it relates to timely topics, I think is great. But then I think also thinking about what is the timeless piece of this? How do I say something that is universal, that is lasting? Because as much as the timely aspect will spark a reader's interest, you want it, your words to stay with them. And um, and so touching on something that is deep within the human spirit, uh, something that we is bedrock to our understanding of who we are, or how we live and move about in the world. Um, when you have that kind of connection, I think editors notice that too. And they say, okay, this isn't just a flash in the pan piece. This isn't just chasing the headline, chasing the ambulance. This is something that is worthy of taking up space in a publication on, you know, on the internet um, that's worthy of lasting a little bit longer than just maybe a tweet would. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, you mentioned staying in your lane and I think sometimes people can feel boxed in by having a niche, mm -hmm. but I think what that really does, and you can tell me if you agree, is it actually expands your possibilities because it, it, it forces you to think in a more narrow way, but then you can connect that subject, um, in so many different ways to so many different things. And so rather than being overwhelmed almost by the subject matter, you're like, okay, I'm attached to sort of this area and how does it relate to this, that, and the other thing? And you'll be surprised how when you take the time to brainstorm that, you actually can find a lot. And the brainstorming is a big, a big thing of mine. And it's like the most simple, you know, basic thing you can do, but we're so busy that we don't take the time to do it. But if you are a writer, if you are a creative, you have to take that time to empty your schedule, to empty your mind and sit down and just think. And that's a discipline, right? Uh, do you, do you have a practice where you spend time being creative like that? Yeah. So, you know, I worked with a writing coach, Ann Croker, and she said, when you've run out of ideas, write a list of 10 things mm -hmm. and, uh, and force yourself to find 10. And if you can't get 10, you're going to have to force yourself to write another 10. And, um, and so that ideation process, I think is really important. You know, I'm working with my fourth grade daughter on writing her paragraphs of the week. Now they're in school and uh, they're doing that whole draw bubble and the lines that come off of it. And, you know, it seems so simplistic. Like this is what we teach our elementary school students to do but I pull out my bullet journal and suddenly I'll be like okay I know my lane is bereavement support but how can this connect to fashion and then I start thinking about these two things that seem so disparate and wow I've got this like what if we talked about bringing back the use of black in in um in culture after after someone dies or what about those black bands that uh sports players wear after the death of a teammate and suddenly you find oh, wow, my lane that felt so narrow actually connects to sports and yeah. science. And, and it just allows you, I think, when, the, when you do a list or you do the, um, the ideas, you know, a, a sort of graphic kind of idea brainstorming uh, activity, it allows you to see that your lane is not narrow, but it mm. is the resource from which you can uh, draw to talk about a variety of new things in a way that makes you sound intelligent, that you don't mm -hmm. have to newbie with every single article you write, uh, because that's a lot of work on the research end. Oh, yeah. I will say, you know, I write about a couple different niches. Um, but it's always, it gets easier over time because I, I, there's a writer that I used to read and I thought to myself, how does he always just like pull these random quotes and statistics out of like, you know, 1975, where's he getting this? And over the time I realized like, I do that too. Like I am like pulling statistics out of my head because I've been writing about this topic for a couple of years. And so it's easy for me to remember what I've reported on before. It's easy for me to be like, oh yeah, like that organization talks about this or that person had a quote on this. And so you're really building up this like huge foundation of knowledge for yourself when you kind of stay in that one area and then it becomes deeper and richer and just you're finding elements that you would never find had you not gone that deep before in other ways. And so that's where you'll find, I think, some of the best writing from people who have stayed within it and then are able to dig deeper and find the things that nobody kind of on the surface would find otherwise. Um, wow. So that's a great, great point. Well, um, editors love that too. Yes. It needs to be said that when you stay in your lane, an editor gets to know you and your lane and will come to you. I mean, I've had occasions yes. where an editor has said like, hey, we've got this topic. Could you write about it? Because they know this is my lane. Yes. And 
And so I think, you know, if you're talking about pitching, pitching is great, but isn't it even more awesome when the editor comes to you? It's so great. <laughs> so <laughs> get to that place because you've consistently stayed in your lane, you've become a trusted voice, that just, um, it expands the possibilities for your writing because now you have an editor who is thinking about the pitch ideas alongside of you. Um, yes. Double, double of the, of the ideation work with just, um, with one writer. And I, it's, I think that's wonderful too. That is, I'm so glad that you brought up that point because it is like the biggest thrill for me to get an email from an editor and this yeah. is, Hey, we're thinking about something like, could you, what do you think you could do something on this? And I'm like, heck yes. Like yeah. I'm a little bit too ecstatic about it. Like I had one recently that was like, could you write it by tomorrow? And I was like, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like way too excited. Like that's, I, you know, you got to have boundaries. Um, but that is such a good point. Um, you're making a name for yourself. Uh, unfortunately, I know some people don't like to think about this, but it is a branding thing. You're almost like giving yourself a brand name. And I know you and I both kind of think in marketing terms, but, um, you know, it's helpful. It's helpful to your profession. Okay. So, um, I feel like we could talk about so many things, but I'm going to um, stop you there. And also for those that are watching, um, Clarissa and I just actually did a longer interview about writing that I'm going to be including in my upcoming course, which we're going to talk about. Um, and Clarissa was a part of my inaugural um, course. It is called Bradworthy Bylines, Get Paid and Published. And I just wanted to have her on to just like tell me her experience of it and to talk to you guys about, you know, why she found it beneficial to enroll in this course. So Clarissa, I don't know, just a couple thoughts that you had about taking the course. Yeah, I, you know, I was a seasoned writer, but when I got to know you, I thought this is a woman I could learn a lot from. <laughs> uh, and just your motivation, the way that you dial down and get really practical, I found was just so helpful to me. You know, I have my own rhythms for writing, but um, they're sort of higgledy piggledy. They're past <laughs> I love that phrase. I try to figure out, like, how do I how do I maximize the time that I have and be as productive as I can? And I feel like Brad, Bragworthy Bylines just did that for me. It offered me some really practical tools so that I could sit down when I had an hour and say, okay, this is what I hope to accomplish. And boom, 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 this is how I'm going to get it done. Uh, so I found that it was practical. I also found that it was inspiring too, to just be able to dream big. I think mm -hmm. a part of the pitching and publishing process is just the nitty gritty. It's the going back and forth with editors. It's the invoicing to make sure I get paid for this job, you know? And, um, and sometimes we don't take a chance to just step back and say, what are your dream big three? Like, mm -hmm. who do you want to be? If, if you could, who would you publish for? And I think that's just an important part of, of staying excited about the process. So Bragworthy Bylines was just a great way to pair that practical resource help with just getting excited about where my, my publishing career could go. Yeah, that, that top three question is just one I just always love to ask. I ask everyone that right off the bat. And I think it goes back to um, when I first started freelancing, I had, I literally, I got this uh, marker board just for this. And I wrote down all the places that I wanted to be published. Like, there was probably like 20 of them. And oh, I just started checking them off. I was like, I'm going to do it. You know, it's stuff that just, I mean, there's still things that I haven't checked off. Like I always say, you'll always hear me say, I want to publish in the Atlantic and I haven't done it and I don't know how to do it. Like, I'm, I believe, but, you know, believe in you. <laughs> one of these days I'm going to have the right idea for the Atlantic and it's going to work out. And, you know, I have a, more confidence now because I've done it other places um, but you know, it's like, I don't know, you know, it's like, I cannot believe that I have been published three times in the New York times that I've been published three times in the wall street journal. If you had told me that when I first made that list and put those publications on there, I would have been like three times. Are you kidding me? Like I was just going for once, like maybe. And so I think the power of being in a group of people also that are excited about the same things. I know one of my great friends, um, Alexandra Hudson, um, she's been a part of this uh, like online conversation with me. She's been a, a huge encouragement to me. And so we have like the weekly coaching calls where you can talk with other people. And the whole thing is, is like, I am just, I really am like, just want to be a cheerleader. Like I'm so excited for people. And you know, half the reason that I started the course is because I was sitting here going, you know, like you can get published, right? Like I would just start telling random people, people that didn't want to be published, you know, I'd be like, well, you should write about that. Like you could get that published in the Washington Post's parents section. Like you don't have to be like 
a trained writer. Like you just have to have the right idea. And I was like, well, I'm talking to people that actually don't care about this. So let's talk to people that actually have this dream. And, um, it, it all comes down to really knowing how to do it. And I was so bad at pitching when I started, like I had no idea what I was doing. And now that I've sort of figured out what it is you need to do and say in the process, I'm like, I want other people to realize like, this is a possibility for them. You don't have to just type on Facebook status updates, like, you know, and, and you can get paid. That's the great thing is like, not only can you get published, you can get paid. And that's the other half of it. Um, and I'm so excited that I've been able to make part of my living from being a freelance writer. It's been amazing. I know you have the same experience. So, um, so thank you for indulging me in that, Clarissa. I really right. appreciate it. Um, how can people find you and your work and um, it, any last words of encouragement to those aspiring freelance writers? Well, you can find me at mall Clarissa. I'm over here. Uh, and you can find me at my website, clarissamall.com. That's where it's like the list of all the places that I'm publishing and uh, more information about my book. But, you know, when I think about pitching and publishing, it is, it is a long obedience it, it, toward your goal. Mm -hmm. It is, discipline of getting on there and uh, spending time brainstorming. We, we think that maybe we've got to wait until we have a good idea, but a lot of great ideas come out of just disciplined brainstorming. And, um, and then having the courage to put yourself out there. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I was married to an editor and I've been an editor and I know that it can be really hard to have invested in words and send them out into the world feeling like they're really vulnerable. But editors are looking for ideas. They are yes. always looking for content. And it helps to remember that they are hungry for your words. And so all you have to do is present them in a way that's attractive and appealing. That when you do that, then you are going to be surprised at how receptive editors can be and, and how fantastic they are to work with, how motivated they are to get your words into print too. Definitely. Okay. We got a quick question. If you have a second, somebody said, what does disciplined brainstorming look like? Mm. Oh, such a good question. Okay. So, uh, for me, it looks like spending time with my bullet journal. It means mm. taking a half hour and saying, okay, these are some ideas that I have. How do I relate them to the lane in which I write? Uh, and then taking the one that looks the best and saying, okay, force myself to make three main points. Could I make three main points out of this? If I could, then I'll take it to the next level. Okay, then I'll find some research that might support those points. But it's really just taking uh, time to get all your ideas out on paper, choose one that seems viable, and then uh, force yourself to build a skeleton of a content around it. And then if you feel like, oh gosh, you know, I could only make two main points about that. Well, maybe you save that and move on to something else. And you'll find that over time, you can use that information for another thing. You know, no, never throw anything away. Never throw anything away. All ideas are, are not wasted, mm -hmm. uh, are not usable in the moment. Um, but yeah, allowing yourself to kind of mentally build out an article before you've ever even written about it, I think is a great uh, a practice that you can integrate into your publishing life, like into your writing life on a weekly uh, basis. Yeah, it really eliminates writer's block too. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I mean, no yeah, go ahead. There's no such thing as the muse. There's really, there's no such thing as writer's block per se. Like there's no imaginary thing that is holding you back. It's really just the discipline of, you know, you go to work out, you go to run, you want to keep running. You know, you just do put one foot in front of the other and you're going to be okay. Yeah, I would say uh, something I've been doing lately is, you know, because I've gotten a lot more writing lately. And so I am being forced to like, okay, I have to discipline myself for this. And I will literally just throw up the laziest, like kind of main points or like worst sentences I've ever written. Um, like the day before I'm really going to get into it because when I can start with that, um, it's so much faster and so much better. Um, and so, and so I don't put a lot of energy into it. I just say, okay, I'm just going to like brainstorm. I'm just going to throw this stuff on the page and then I'm going to come back to it tomorrow. And then it all sort of comes together. That's a process that works for me at least. <laughs> yep. oh, all right, Clarissa. Well, thank you so much. And everybody go follow Clarissa if you are not already. And I really appreciate you talking with me today. Thanks, Erica. Bye. Bye.